Welcome to Mystery Bible. My name is Ken Primus. We have been looking at the Exodus. Uh, the last uh, podcast we talked about the uh, Job. Uh, mentioned to you that this Job was the same Job, I believe, that is mentioned in book number 18 in the King James Version. But we know that this Job story According, even according to King James, that they weren't sure where it was. But when we look at other um, other documentation, it is placed within the time frame that um, the sons of uh, Jacob had passed, and that this Job was there as one of the counselors to the Pharaoh of the time, and it was this Job. Uh, that had um, given the advice to the king of the sons, uh, slaughtering of the elder son. And we're going to take a look at that circumstances and, and when the king had called his servants, and you'll see in mentioned in the book that it was Job, same location um, as well. So let's take a look at... Um, Chapter 2 of Genesis, uh, because we, not Genesis, I apologize, of Exodus. We are looking at that aspect of it right now. And I want to, um, as I've been telling you guys, we're using the Bible first, and then we're going to branch off to the other sources, and we're going to pick up from there. And uh, again, my purpose is simply to bring in additional information outside of the Bible, along with the story in the Bible, to show you what was happening around and some of the details that were left out as a result in the Bible. I know that Western Christianity live and die by the quote-unquote King James Version, but trust me, the King James Version is full of uh, interpretation uh, based on what they wanted to bring out, like the, uh, the Trinity was not a part of um, the teachings in the early church. Uh, God was uh, Elohim uh, in the personhood of the Holy Spirit, Jesus, and the Father. It was introduced to for clarity, and so they had to come up with a way by which they can um, explain it to people. That's how they failed. And as a result, you have lots of battles in religion concerning the Trinity and stuff like that and missing the point who God is. So, in chapter 2 of Exodus, uh, let's summarize, basically. We know that Moses is born. In that chapter, he's raised by Pharaoh's uh, daughter. And uh, we know that uh, he uh, slays an Egyptian as a result of um, uh, seeing the injustice that was being executed to, against the children of Israel. You know, he, he flees to Midian and uh, marries Zephora. And uh, we know that it is around that time after he flees that um, the cries of the children of Israel um, started to uh, reach the heavens, as they say. And we're going to explore all of those. He might be able to do it in one, but who knows? Let's see where it goes. Let me began to read chapter 2, and there went a man of, of the house of Levi and took a wife, a daughter of Levi, and the woman conceived and bare a son. And when she saw him, that he was a goodly child, she hid him three months. And when she could no longer hide him, she took him from the ark and bustled and debris it with slime and with pitch and put the child therein, and she laid it in the flag by the river brick. And his sister stood afar off, which what would be done to him. We know that his sister is in reference to Miriam. And the daughter of Pharaoh came down to wash herself at the river, and her handmaid walked along by the riverside, and when she saw the ark among the flag. She sent her maid to fetch it. Let me stop here for a minute and um, give you guys some information. 
the Bible says, and I don't believe that anything happens or just happenstance. The Bible tells us in, in Jeremiah that God made plans, many plans for us all. And all of those plans that he has made, the outcome of those plans is to give us victory. And he has mentioned that many times, even in the New Testament, that for all things, work together for good for those who love the Lord. All things meaning all the plans that come into your life. Just like Jeremiah said, I have made many plans. And so he had a plan for Moses. Think about it, that out of all the Hebrew boys on the planet at the time, that Pharaoh's daughter would see his. And so and see him that uh, so we know that God has a plan for all of you. I would want to encourage you to plug into God so so that He can reveal to you what those plans are. And those plans are based on decisions that we make. But the Bible tells us that we can go to Him, and He will lead our path. He says, "Many are the plans of of a man, but the steps." Uh, God orders his steps. So I would suggest that you seek God's advice in helping you walk in within those plans that he has for your life. So we see then that Pharaoh's, one of God's plans, or Moses' life, was that Pharaoh's uh, daughter would be there at that specific time doing what she was doing so that she can grab him and bring him into her house so that she can then educate him and remove uh, the Egyptian so that uh, God can utilize him later for his assignment that he has for him. God has an assignment for everyone. You and I are not just coming here to live, work nine to five, have some kids, get a white picket fence, and, um, you know, die and then show up. And that, I mean, think about that for a minute. So God has plans for you. You need to go seek Him to see what those are. And as you learn who you are in Christ Jesus, you will learn about those plans and how you can serve mankind. Because that is the ultimate gift that you and I have on this planet. And when she had opened it, she saw the child, and behold, the baby wept. And she had compassion on him and said, This is one of the Hebrew Hebrews' children. Remember I talked to you guys, all of you that have been following me, we have been talking and expounding on uh, the, the grace of God. And God is the only one that can, can give grace because he's the God of all grace. And so the grace is God's ability to work on the hearts of individuals. The Bible tells us that the king, uh, the heart of the king is in the hand of God. And so we know that the heart of everyone, the scripture says, every you, me, the politicians, everyone is in the king, the heart of uh, the hand of God. And God then can move it to uh, fulfill his desire. He cannot violate our will, but through his grace, he can cause us to do things. And um, we then would make it, the reaction to it, and her reaction about seeing this child and hearing him cry was compassion. And if you follow compassion, you will see that compassion always demands action. And so she had compassion on him, and she said, "Okay." So compassion always demands action. So when you see someone that is compassionate. You will always see the results of compassion. You cannot have compassion without any action. So then she said, uh, then said his sister to Pharaoh's daughter, Shall I go and call the, uh, a nurse, the Hebrew women, that he may nurse the child for you? This is still Miriam. And Pharaoh's daughter said to her, Go. And the maid went and called the child's mother. So Miriam is stating, uh, 
Pharaoh's sister was a maid and a maid to uh, Pharaoh's daughter. And so she now is going to go and bring his mother because she saw she's a part of this whole thing. And um, verse 9, And Pharaoh's daughter said unto her, Take this child away and nurse it for me, and I will give you uh, wages. And the woman took the child and nursed it. Isn't the God a wonderful? She is going to be paid. The mother now, the family is going to be paid for taking care of their child. And so this is wonderful. I think is a great um, way by which God provides additional need for his family so that they can be provided for as well as cared for in a special way. Verse 10. And the child grew and she brought unto him Pharaoh's daughter and he became her son. So at some point there was an um, exchange that happened and she adopted him in other words. Um, she went through her own adoption agency back in the day and so she got him and he became he became her son. And so now when she he is now becoming her son. He is going to be treated differently. He is going to be respected. He is coming to a different class. And so that's the same with you and I. When we are born again, we are the sons of God. We became his son. And um, the Bible tells us, God said that to, this, to Jesus that this day I, you, I have thought me, you are now my son. So we are seeing this exchange taking place with you know, Moses and with uh, Pharaoh's um, daughter. And she called his name Moses. And she said, Because I drew him out of the water. And it came to pass in those days when Moses was grown, that he went out unto his brethren and look their burden, look on their burden. And he spied an Egyptian smiting an Hebrew on his brethren. So we see that he's checking his say out. So he's not comfortable, if you will, uh, where he is, his location with his uh, Pharaoh's family and all the power and so forth. Because God never keeps you and I comfortable when he has work. For us, there's always some degree of restlessness that resides within us, and that restlessness is uh, for you and I to keep looking, keep moving, keep seeking where we fit in. And so, we see that um, this man Moses, he's not there amongst all the power. He's still spying out the Egyptians, and he's concerned. About his brothers. And that's one of the signs of a servant when you look at people. One who's concerned about others. And that is why I can tell you guys, you see that this is the ultimate prize that, that God wants to give all of us and that, um, that you and I become servants. So we see that um, he is spying on these, uh, these guys. And when he went out the second day, behold, two men. Of the Hebrews stole to work, uh, together, and he said unto them, um, That did the wrong. Why smitest thou your fellow? And he said, Who made you prince over and judge over us? And so, let me go back in verse 12. After verse 11, we see that he, after he saw this injustice happening, to his brothers, he tells us in verse 12 that he looked this way and that way, and he saw that there were no man, so he killed the Egyptian and hid him in the sand. So we see that he is a what we would consider a murderer. And I want to let you guys know that God will work with you, all of you guys who think, think you are, you know, you're, you're bad and you've come to the end and you're this, this monster. 
Gon is okay with that. He, he likes monsters. Um, you can work with them. Uh, if you have a, a heart that is willing to be humbled before him, yeah, he'll work with you. And so we know then that this man, because this man, Moses, God, um, uh, he became really, really close to God. In fact, the Bible tells us that God reprimanded his sister Miriam and he told him, he says, I speak to him face to face, where I speak to other people, other prophets in dreams and so forth. So, there is a murderer that God was able to work with, but it's the degree of your heart. And so, on verses 14, his brothers, the Egyptian, um, the two guys are fighting, and he said, who made you prince and a judge? over us. Intended thou to kill us as thou killest the Egyptian? And Moses feared and said, surely this thing is known. So we've talked about the spirit of fear, one of the entities that will always come into our life to cause us to make decisions based on fear. And the world today is like that, the whole entire world, because we know that when Adam fell, one of the first mentioned um, spirits that he became familiar with was fear. He said to God, I was afraid. And so you and I are still going to be dealing with that entity in our life. So now we see that he begins to he become fearful, fear entered into his life, and he began to make a decision and got out of there. Um, so, basically running for his life. Now, when Pharaoh heard this thing, he sought to slay Moses. But Moses fled from the place of Pharaoh and dwelt in the land of Midian. And he sat down by a well. So he's gone. He sits down by this well. Now the priests of Midian had seven daughters, and they came and drew water and filled the broth to water their father's flock, and the shepherd came and drove them away. But Moses stood up and helped them and watered their flock. So he now begins to protect us. He sees this injustice, and he begins to um, stand up. Now, I want to stop here, right here. This is his character. Are you beginning to see the man's character come up? Uh, where he's seeing some type of injustice, he's always standing up. Uh, we see it with his uh, with the man, and then when the two brothers fighting, um, the two Hebrews fighting, we see him interjecting himself in there. We see here with these uh, ladies that he's also interjecting himself in it. So we're watching his character as to who he is as. Moses, the, uh, the man on the run from the Egyptian. And so uh, we're looking at this, uh, I would say, the development of this man and see how God will work with those traits that you and I have. And it tells us that, uh, and when they came, when the shepherds came and drove them away, but Moses stood up and helped them and watered it walk, so he did all the work for them. And when they came to a rule, the father, he said, how is it that you'll come back so soon uh, today? And they said, an Egyptian delivered us out of the land of the, of the shepherds, and also drew water enough for us, and watered the flock. Now, when they said, an Egyptian, that to me it meant that he must have still been in his Egyptian clothes, he, stuff that Egyptian wears. And so when they saw that, they are familiar with that type of, um, you know, dressing. So he had the finest of the finest stuff. And they recognized that that's Egyptian. And they said, this Egyptian helped us. And he said unto his daughters, and where is he? Why is it that you have left the man? Call him that he may eat bread. And Moses was content to dwell with the man. And he gave Moses Zephorah, his daughter, and she bare him a son, and he called his name Koshar. And 
he said, I have been a stranger in a strange land. Now, I want to walk you guys through. Now we're in verse 23 of chapter 2. And it came to pass in process of time that the king of Egypt died. And the children of Israel sighed by reason of the bondage. And then they cried. And their cry came up unto God by reason of the bondage. Verse 24. And God heard their groaning, and God remembered his covenant with Abraham, with Isaac, and with Jacob. And God looked upon the children of Israel, and God had respect unto them. Now, verse 23 to 25 is some powerful stuff. So, we have the last episode that I talked about in the podcast was in relation to showing you guys that the word of God, that God never lies, and that he is on top of what he said that he wants to be done. And we looked at several other scriptures that deals with this specificness of the fact that God's word is true. And, um, I've done that many times in studies about God's Word because all of our life and our belief is based on the Word of God. We have to, as believers, we have to trust this God's Word, you know, these words, because if we're putting our faith faith into those words, we ought to then be able to trust that those words will come true. And so Luke chapter 1, verses 37, says, No word from God will ever fail. So let's take a look at what's going on here based on what God had said. You know that Joshua said in Joshua he said uh, none of God's word had failed that he had promised us. So let's take a peek in Genesis chapter 15 I think it is when God came to Abram. Now this is Abram. This is before he became Abraham. So God comes to this man, Abram, and um, he says to him, Know for certain that your descendants will be strangers in a land that is not theirs, where they will be enslaved and oppressed for a hundred years. But I will also judge the nation when they will serve, and afterward they will come out with many possessions. So he's already prophesied 400 years before. Then in the fourth generation, they will return here, for the iniquity of the Amorites is not yet complete. So God works on a timeline. And uh, you and I need to be aware of this. And everything that he does is based on a timeline. Because we just read where it says that he, and it came to pass in process of time. Some translations will say the fullness of time. God works on a timeline that. So he had promised Abraham a couple of things. That he was going to deliver his children, his, his descendants. And this was four years ago. So it took four years. And now God's word. As I mentioned to you guys earlier, God's word will never fail. And so it took 400 years. But there was a reason why he had to go through 400 years. What was the reason that the children of Israel was trying to uh, put all of this intense pressure on the children of Israel? What was the main reason? It's very clear, they have said it. The main reason so that they would not reproduce, trying their best to keep them from not reproducing because they were fearful of them. And why why were they? Because God said to Abraham and to Isaac that um, he is going to make them prosperous, but he's going to make them like, in 
the sand on the seashore and so on and so forth. Genesis 22, 17. That in blessing, I will bless you. And in multiplying, I will multiply your seed as stars of the heaven and as sand which is upon the seashore. And your seed shall possess the gates of his enemies. So we know that he promised that there will be plenty of them and that they will be possessing the gates of the enemy. When they say gates, it's usually the control of that particular city, place, and so forth. When you control the gates, you're in charge, basically. Genesis 22, 17. Uh, I'll read it in another. Um, it says, I will surely bless you and make your descendants as numerous as the stars in the skies and as the sand on the seashore. Your descendants will take possession of the cities of their enemies. And that's why I was saying to you, when you talk about gates, it means that you're totally in control of it all. So this promise um, went through. It tells us that it was, you know, I wanted to take you, that was Genesis, and I wanted to take you to Jacob as well. I know I didn't get a chance to take you to um Oh, the other one, Isaac, but I wanted to bring you from uh, Genesis, from Abraham to uh, Jacob and show you in Jacob because it's there in, in the Bible. I just didn't bring it out to, to show you guys in Israel. But let's take a look at Genesis chapter 32, verses 12. And it says, And then Jacob prayed, God of my father Abraham, God of my, uh, of my father Isaac, God, who told me, go back to your parents' homeland, and I will treat you well. I don't deserve all the love and loyalty you have shown me. When I left here and crossed the Jordan, I only had the clothes on my back. And not look at me. Two, and now look at me. Now two camps. Save me, please, from the violence of my brother. And you know about me. Uh, Jacob and Esau. Um, so, my anger, angry brother, I'm afraid he will come and attack us. Me, the mother of my children, you yourself said, I will treat you well and I'll make your descendants like the sands of the sea. Far too many count. So, it took 400 years from when God uh, was dealing with this one man, Abraham, and, um, or Abram, this is before he had his son, it took 400 years for them to build up a descendant like the sand of the sea, far too many to count. So God's timeline is different from us, but his purpose is to fulfill his word. So after four years, 400 years, he told Abraham, he said, this is how long it's going to take. But I just want to encourage you that um, after that, I'm, I'm going to take care of business. I'm going to make sure that they are able to gain uh, you know, success. I'm going to take care of them. He said, God said to Abraham, this Abram, this is before Abraham, so this is his son is not born yet. Know for certain that your descendants will be strangers in a land that is not theirs, where they will be enslaved and oppressed four hundred years. So four hundred years it took the children of Israel to multiply and become like the sand of the sea. And the Bible tells us when it was time, and it was on God's timetable. So, you and I have to be careful about all these madness you see people are doing. Let me tell you, I'm not moved by any of this stuff that is happening around the world. It's being, you see all this um, shift towards 
oligarchy and and one you know these guys are shifting into power, consolidating power. Uh, Xi and and Putin and, and you see Trump on the stage and you see all these other clowns that are there. None of them, none of them are working outside of God's sphere. Not a single one. Do you understand me? They are being molded and moved in order to accomplish for a stage set the Antichrist to come because it tells us that when he shows up that he is ruler over much of this real estate that is on the earth. So these guys, don't. I don't care what happens, I belong to the kingdom of God. And the Bible tells me that the kingdom of God is not shaken. Now, I'm watching the world outside of the kingdom of God, and it is all messed up and going all kinds of crazy. But it's supposed to, because the Bible tells us that they're moving on God's timetable, and in the fullness of time, the Bible says God is going to begin to do a couple of things that will show up on this planet. And uh, one of those is that the Antichrist is coming. One of those is as it was in the days of Noah. And the Bible tells us about uh, global warming. The Bible talks about it, so I don't know how these ignorant people that are calling themselves Christians don't understand it because Jesus said, in the last days, this is what's going to be happening with nature. Now, if he's saying it, right, we call it global warming, but he was calling it something else. He said, you're going to have diver um, uh, events. You know, he's talking about those uh, events as far as natural disasters and all of these things. So he was calling it what he saw it. We are calling it um, global warming. But Jesus talked about it. And so it's going to happen. And so we know that this is all a part of God's plan. Not a single one of these men and women. The Bible tells us that. And I've done a study on this and to show people that every leader is put in place to accomplish God's will, period. And we know that in Pharaoh's life, God told Moses before he even sent him, he said, I am going to try this man until when he, his son dies. Then he's going to release you when his firstborn dies. And then that's before he went in to start all this stuff. And we're going to see that. And so, what happened? What God had to do to favor Pharaoh to make that happen? He had to heart, harden his heart to have Pharaoh fulfill what God had told Abraham. I'm going to deliver you after his son, all the sons, the firstborn, are judged and die. Then I'll bring you out. And so, um, in order for God to do that, he hardened his heart to make it happen. And what I'm saying to you guys is simply this. It doesn't matter. I don't care who you are. No word from God will ever fail because he always tells the truth. And so it took 400 years for the children of Israel to get to a place whereby their seed is as many as the this, seed. This and so I wanted to Take that time to walk with you and see, so you will understand, because all the people don't understand what was going on and, um, you know, why did God wait all this time and so forth. Because he said in his timeline, the children of Israel had to multiply. So it didn't matter whatever Egypt did. It didn't matter what crazy plan they came up with. They cannot not stop the children of Israel. From multiplying. There is no way. There is no way man can stop the plan of God. Uh, we can come to him through prayer and uh, um, we know that uh, the plan of God concerning um, Sodom and Gomorrah was to destroy it. You know? When he comes to, Moses, uh, to Abraham and he said, uh, I mean, could we destroy this place without telling him? And so, they went and they told him. So now this man is going to pray for them because he's now praying for them not to be destroyed. And so he starts with X amount of people and he ends up with, you know, just a few. And God said, okay, man, 
but he was he was trying his best, and God was still working with him. God said, "Okay," and then he said, every time God said, "Okay," he he brought the number down. God said, "Okay," and he brought the number down. God said, "Okay," <laughs> you know. And so it was Abraham's negotiation based on his negotiation with God. God was. Relaying back to him, okay, 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 okay. And then eventually when he came to his his number, and God said, okay, guess what? They didn't have that many, and God destroyed it anyway. So I want to uh, make that clear to you guys. So we see here that in Exodus, a couple of things I wanted to bring to you was that process of time, in the fullness of time, God works. The other is that uh, everything that happens here, uh, there's a, the Egyptian died and the children of Israel began to cry. That leader that punished them passed and um, they are now crying to God. Now what does the Bible teach us about the people of God crying, and what happens to God when he is hearing our cry. It's very important. We need to know this. Many of us are not going to cry on God until it gets really bad. And it tells us in verse 23, And it came to pass in the process of time that the king of Egypt died, and the children of Israel sighed by reason of the bondage. Now, did not we read in Genesis that God said he was going to deliver his children out of slavery and out of oppression, basically out of bondage. And so he promised that he would deliver them. And uh, so it reads that he said that he would deliver them out of bondage, and they, but they were crying. They started crying to God. Now, and their cry came up unto God by reason of bondage. And verse 24, the beginning, and God heard their groaning, and God remembered his covenant with Abraham, Isaac and with Jacob. Now, a couple of things. God heard, God remembered. So, God listened. The Bible said He's always listening to us. Samuel chapter 22, verse 7. In my distress, I call unto the Lord, to my God, I call. From His temple, He heard my voice. And my cry came to his ears. So we know that when we were in that state, that emotional state, uh, we got no other person to look at. We, I can't do it within myself. I got nothing left. In my distress, Psalm 18, 6, I call unto the Lord, to my God. I cried for help. From his temple he heard my voice, and my cry to him reach his ears. So, you and I sometimes, that's the only time we will call on God is when we got no hope. We will cry to him, but the Bible tells us that he hears. Oh God, hear my prayer, give ear to the words of my mouth, Psalm 54, verse so God listened. He remembered. And the Bible tells us that when God is alerted, and I did a study a few days ago about this, arise to God. When we look at that scripture and we see that God is going to arise, we know some business is about to be taken care of. We know that God is going to bring his judgment and that he is going to begin to require um, some stuff from other people. 
And so the Bible tells us that he hears the cry of and he listens. And I believe in my heart of hearts, man, that uh, we're looking at the poor and the needy crying unto God. And in the fullness of time, which I believe is here, we are seeing the results of the judgment on the nation of, of America because of the cry of the poor. God said, here, when they, I listen to their cry, and uh, we know that these men are a whole slew of politicians are just focusing on themselves and the rich, and they're forgiving uh, loans for themselves and the rich, and they are not even considering the people. And God does not like that at all, man. Just read the Bible. And you will see, I mean, if you guys, we live in a world where now you don't need, we need to read it. Just put it on, on the, on, on, on tape. Put it on, on TV that you're watching all day long. There's, there's a, a way by which you can listen to the Word of God. You can listen to the Word of God on the car, listen to the Word in, on your phone. I mean, you have no excuse. None of you have any excuse of not listening to the Word of God and following the Word of God. Just listen to the Word of God, and you'll see He tells you, be very careful how you treat the poor people, because they are crying to Him, and when it reaches His ear, business begins to change. And so, we are watching that in the United States of America, and there is no escaping at all. The Bible says, the rock, His work is perfect. For all his ways are justice. This God, his throne is all about justice. A God of faithfulness and without iniquity. He is just and he is upright. This God means business when we disobey his word. It is unthinkable that God would do wrong. That the Almighty would pervert justice. It is unthinkable. Thinkable that God would do wrong, that the Almighty would pervert justice. Look at these men, these women that are claiming to be Christian. It is unthinkable that God would do wrong, then the Almighty would be very mindful, guys. God works on a timeline, and He always provide, uh, finishes work. Or he always answers what He said, and He doesn't make any joke. He's serious, He's a loving God. But sometimes it can be very stern um, to protect you and I from harm. So I want to thank you guys for uh, following me on all of these different podcasts. I know we are all over it within the podcast, and those that are following me with um, on the YouTube and different uh, social media platforms, I truly, honestly want to thank you, and those that are supporting us financially. I want to thank you. I, 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 you know, I thank you for stopping to uh, uh, support us financially. I know many of you is uh, just five dollars and and ten dollars here, and I really appreciate all of it because I know where it's coming from and your heart um, and your kindness and your your um, ability to share in all of your abundance and even those that are not in abundance I know your sacrifice and so I, I deeply appreciate it and I do pray for you and your family that God will uh, uh, show you ways by which you can um, gain more insight number one as to who you are number two that he would gain show you insight by which you can expand your businesses those that are all entrepreneurs and so forth, or maybe a job that you're asking for, that he would expand your with your your knowledge and wisdom, so that you can gain entrance. The Bible tells about the Holy Spirit, guys, anointing you for wisdom and so forth. So ask him, and he will do the same for you and change your direction for you and your family. Again, I just want to thank you so much for coming. And following us here at Mr. Bible. 
Darkness. 